North Korea, the problem with the North Korea issue is just they have so much artillery and stuff and the proximity of Seoul to the DMZ and to a lot of South Korea, you know, is all in range of that stuff. Um, their capabilities are fairly limited, honestly, like from an air to air standpoint, it would have been fun. I'd have been an ace in a day, man. I mean, we would <laughs> we would have been crushing things over there. Um, but, you know, a uh, large army, not very capable, but they've got a lot of people to throw at the problem. Pretty brainwashed. Um, so they're probably going to fight for a while. I have no, I, I have no doubt that if that thing were ever to kick off, that South Korea with the United States would have no problem winning that campaign. Um, it would be ugly at the beginning for sure. Um, but ought to be, if I'm completely honest with you, when I was there, at least in the time frame that I was there from 01 to 02, it felt like we were we were there more to keep the South from going north sometimes than we were keeping the North from going south. Really? That's that's yeah. fast. I've never I've never heard anyone say the the stat that you always hear get thrown around about North Korea's air force is their pilots average something like 20 hours a year. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. And they're flying yeah. planes that are 50, 60, oh, they're 70 so old. years old. Like the majority of their aircraft are what we call teenagers or the MiG, like, you know, 15, 17, 19, 21. They've got a couple of MiG 29s, but nothing. I mean, it would be, especially with the stealth capabilities we have now, man, it'd be, it wouldn't even be fair. That's fascinating. I could I could talk about the North Korean uh, topic for hours on end just because that by itself is just absolutely crazy. But I want to talk about Operation Northern Watch because it's yeah. not something I know a lot about. I know that the younger viewers of this podcast also almost certainly don't have any clue about it. Can you walk us through what that was and what your role specifically was in it? Yeah. So when I left Korea, I went to Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina and Shaw primarily is a was a block 50 unit. So there was at that point in time, there were basically two blocks of the F-16, the block 40 and the block 50. Block 40, primarily air to ground centered, uh, dual role, but air to ground centric. And then the block 50 is your wild weasel asset. It's the suppression of enemy air defenses. We're the guys that go out in front of the strike train or support the strike train and try to get the surface air missiles to come online so that we can shoot high speed anti-radiation missiles at them and put them down. Um, so I was in a Block 50 unit at Shah. We deployed to Interlake Air Base in Turkey and went to uh, Operation Northern Watch. This was in, let's see, I got to Shah in 02. Um, so this was like, I think we left in August of 02 and we came back in, it was either December or January. Uh, the squadron actually went out, I think, in like, june but we only had eight aircraft there because it was a pretty it was actually a pretty small operation and so half the squadron went for the first half and then the other half of the squadron went for the second half and i was out there for the second half um after the gulf war what the air force did or what the united states department of defense did was they basically had northern watch and southern watch so you had northern watch guys flying out of interlick and then the southern guys southern watch guys flying out of saudi and we basically took iraq and didn't allow them to fly aircraft south of the 33rd parallel or north of the 36th. Um, the big issue in the northern part for O&W was Kurdistan. Um, we didn't want the Iraqis carrying out air-to-air air, air air or air-to-ground operations against the Kurds in the north. Um, and we also wanted to give a buffer, I think, for Turkey at the time. Um, so we would go out every day uh, for about six hours a day, and we would patrol the no-fly zone. Uh, which the 36th parallel is basically runs just south of Mosul. So M Mosul north of the line into Iraq. So we take off out of Turkey. We'd fly. We basically hug the Syrian border, go out to a tanker location that was just in uh, the north part of, or the just across the border in Turkey. We'd hit the tanker and then we'd push in for our, our, our what we call a vulnerability period. And during that operation, this is obviously pre the the second war with Iraq yeah. in, in yep. 03. During any point of this no fly zone, did we ever end up striking any Iraqi so, planes? No. Well, yeah. So uh, I know in Southern Watch in the 90s, there was, in fact, I can tell you a story from my time at Balad Air Base in Iraq, where I flew with the three star CFAC, who's famous for shooting down an Iraqi aircraft when he was patrolling the skies of Southern Watch um, in an F-16. And uh, so we they would, they would launch aircraft and they would come up and bump the border every once in a while. So our package typically consisted of F-15Cs that were doing air superiority, 
you had us that were do there to do suppression of enemy air defense because the Iraqis would still roll out um, SA twos and SA threes into the northern part of the country, but they'd always park them by mosques or schools or things like that, and then they'd try to light us up um, and things like that, knowing that we wouldn't strike them. Um, and then we had British Jaguars. And the Jaguars at that time were primarily doing recce runs. They were doing reconnaissance runs over that northern part of Iraq. Um, most of the time in the Mosul area, looking for different things. Um, but kind of all over that northern portion, north of the 36th. And then we had a... I don't know if you're familiar with Rivet Joint, but Rivet Joint is just a big collections platform that we fly. And we had the Brits version of Rivet Joint, uh, call sign Merlin, there with us as well. And so... Um, that was basically what the package was every day. And we'd go in and we were basically there to do suppression and then to back up for any potential air threat. And what are the, what are the Iraqis flying at this time? I imagine someone, maybe the North Koreans have like really old school MIGs. Yeah. The Iraqis had MIG 23s, MIG 27s, um, MIG 29s. Uh, I think they had a few Fox bats, maybe MIG 25s. Um, so they had a, you know, a spattering of different Russian made aircraft. And did you at any time get nervous that this, this no fly zone operation was going to turn into like a really hot shooting situation where the Iraqis were like, Oh, we'll test it. We'll put some of these service to air missiles. We'll fly to the border, but we're not actually going to try to go in there and do anything. I mean, we wished they would honestly, like nobody ever wants to play with us, man. So it's kind of frustrating because nobody really ever wants to play an air to air game with us. Um, but no, not really. I mean, we get shot at most days, but it was always AAA. Um, I remember my very first sortie going in to uh, northern Iraq. We were we had these little spots on the ground that we had little designators for. And there was this one place that was a bunch of like this huge orchard farm. We called it the farms. And uh, I was running in uh, doing seed support for the Jaguars on their recce run and Dude, it's just, it's really like the movies. Like the movies actually get it pretty close. Like all these popcorn puffs just start shoot, popping up all over the sky. Most of it's unguided. Um, you know, they'd hear something and they'd start shooting. Uh, a couple of times you, the RJ, our Merlin would say, you know, they had, again, they would use the different reference points. They had, uh, there's a big dam north of Mosul. We call it Saddam Dam. And they had AAA pieces lined up all across that thing. So anytime you were flying over that, you'd always look down. Was that Hadi was was that Haditha Dam? Yeah, I think yeah. so. And uh we called it Saddam Dam, but um I remember one day I was flying, I was they were the Jags were going in a route and um I hear uh on the radio I hear Saddam Dam firing and I look out the the jet on my right side and I've got a triple A explosion that's about three thousand feet behind me and about three thousand feet below me that's following me. And then right after that they called Saddam Dam eyes on, which means that they had basically intercepted their communications that they were actually visual with an aircraft. And I'm pretty sure it was me that day. So I just started to do a weave uh, so that they wouldn't be able to see me at altitude anymore. And uh, we just kept going. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. I, th this is why I like doing this because this is history. I've never heard. This is history that a lot of the audience has never heard. And yeah, yeah there's no fly zone. And it, it, like you said, they didn't want to test you. It's just not fair. The technology gap, I mean, and now we're 20 plus years yeah. past that. I can only imagine we'll get into that a little bit later. I want to walk.